Let's try it now. Hi. This is going well. Welcome to Bible study with the audio now. <laughs> Doing improved. Okay, so we were discussing that we're on chapter 5, and chapter 5 begins talking about law number 5, which is never tell your real story. Vulnerability is weakness. Now remember, these laws that she's talking about aren't laws that she's recommending. Okay, she's not saying adopt these these things and, and do them. She's saying this is the unspoken, unwritten rules of Christianity, especially as practiced in this country. And these are things that we should avoid. These are rules that we should break if we want to have a real authentic faith. So let's talk about this one a little bit. Um, never tell your real story. Why would that be a vulnerability? People may be able to use that against you. Okay. So they could take personal details and they could try to try to make you out to be something else or try to hurt you with something they know about you. Yep. In my experience, family can be the worst about that. Um, Sometimes it can be. <laughs> <clears throat> We have an expression in the Navy that I can't fully repeat, <laughs> but it's basically, it's, it's basically, it's only the people you trust who can, you, yeah. um, which is true, right? That's true. Um, why would that be the case in the church, though? Because there's people in the church that think, um, how can I say this probably? <laughs> Their stuff don't stink, and they're better than you, and... You call them hypocrites. Yeah. I'm going to try putting this computer over here to see if it'll at least see some of you. That way they don't think I was in here talking to nobody. <laughs> And hopefully it'll still pick up the audio. It looks like it's doing all right. So. And if not, then I'll just get on there and redo it or something. I don't know. Okay. But I want to make sure the world sees you. All right. So... Um, Back to my train of thought. So, why would it be the case in the church? What would the, what would they what would the goal be in a church for somebody to try to uh, hurt you with your real story? Like Stephen was saying, there's a lot of hypocrites in the church that would uh, you know they don't they don't believe in they they're ready to cast that stone, you know. If you tell them, well, yes, I, you know, many years ago I, I sinned in such and such a way, uh, then they'll, they'll continue to to remember that and bring it up. And they'll bring it up or they'll tell somebody, they'll tell somebody else at the mm -hmm. church that you really want to know. No, or right. outside the church. Oh, don't vote for so and so. They did this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so. So there's sometimes I mean I think you go no, that's I mean remember I'm going and I just said they um and if they ever get you know like they get something on your deal just kind of scatter about you know like in I'm going back to high school and you tell your best friend something or another friend and they say the last words you say now don't tell anybody and then before you know it's all over the place <laughs> and uh, so I mean that's kind of so it's, it's bad to be happening in the church because that's how we're supposed to be looking at everybody and, and all that. So. But it does happen I, it in does. the church just right. as much as anywhere else. Right. It's, it's just like that thing. Um, um, critical of that. You tell them one thing, one thing, and mm -hmm. before you know it, it changes. The telephone. Yeah. Yeah. Telephone. Yeah. telephone. Mm -hmm. We used to play that Luther Ridge. Mm -hmm. I used to be intentionally change things. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> I'm not yeah. bad at my fridge. 
that uh, I'm in is the I mean, get please we talk about well um people who come to church and had it dressed and stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know when I was growing up and all we then pay pants to you know, the the church or, or what you know, everybody had even when I was in school, mm -hmm. I wore a skirt I dressed to school every day. So I mean time to change to but uh but I mean it's and then they got. I said, well, you shouldn't be criticizing people, you know, coming into the church because I said they're coming in, hopefully for a reason, you know, to want to learn more about God and all that, and you know, listen to a good sermon and all that, you know. So. Well, Am I right on that, Pastor? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I referenced it Sunday, but you know, over at Trinity. When I was there as a council member, we had a group of people that we had to use the discipline policy as it existed at the time mm -hmm. um, to remove them and trespass them from the property because they not only became destructive, they became dangerous. Oh my goodness. Um, like we, mm. So the, the old policy used to be if you had somebody who was causing a problem in the congregation, it started with the pastor going to them one on one. Mm -hmm. If that didn't work, then the pastor would take another person or maybe two people with him or her and mm -hmm. go to that person again. Mm -hmm. If that didn't work, then the person was called before counsel. Mm -hmm. If that still didn't work, then the issue went to the synodical bishop who would, you know, investigate mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. make a recommendation. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, if if there was no reconciliation at that point, then you could remove the person. Mm -hmm. It's not how it works now because yes. they changed it after we went through everything we went through. Yeah. Oh, all right. um, so what? I mean, what is the thing now? So now it still starts the same way. Pastor goes to the person. Pastor goes to the person with two others. Mm -hmm. Pastor goes to the person and counsel. Mm -hmm. But then, if it goes beyond that. Then it goes to the Committee on Discipline at the Senate level, oh, okay. which will send in a mediator to try to fix things. Okay. If that doesn't go well, then it goes to the uh, the next level, which is up at the Senate, the, the church-wide office, mm -hmm. and they step in to do something. But it, it takes permission from church-wide now to mm -hmm. remove somebody from oh, the okay. So you got to go all the way up to the to the top, so to speak. <laughs> um, but like these people just, they did things to control the church. Like they would they would break into the office to look at the giving records so they could try to run off the people they thought weren't giving enough. Oh my goodness. Um, they like, <laughs> <laughs> they encouraged my dad when we first got there to look for a different church because we may not be church material at that church. Oh my God. Um, mm. And it wasn't until they, they tried to take on a pastor who knew the ropes better than them mm -hmm. that they found out they were wrong. The problem is, <laughs> and she and I have discussed this over the years, there was, there was two sides of trouble in that church. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, they balanced each other out. Oh but goodness. then one side of the trouble allied with the pastor to get the other side out. And then that trouble had the full control. Mm -hmm. And it became even more toxic than it oh was. Good. So I think they're down like eight people now. Mm -hmm. um, and they mm -hmm. have a guy who's coming in and, and leading worship for them every Sunday. The Senate office didn't know he existed until I said something about it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> He's not rostered in the Senate. He's rostered in an upper, or excuse me, lower Susquehanna in Pennsylvania. Oh. He moved down here when he retired. He never told the Senate office <laughs> and then started preaching for him and, and administering the Senate. So. Oh my God. <laughs> oh goodness. Well, like somebody. Don't, don't understand that. You know, uh, said something about it, um, whatever. With eight people, I mean, I don't make a. You know. No, so, but I said we had the. Uh, you probably, I know you heard. 
uh, our this little church has had a lot of history behind it too. When we had asked a pastor to leave, that was the worst. Time. And I was on camp I said, I said, it it well, it upset a lot of people. But I reckon, I mean, I reckon it was something that had to, you know, be done. But and I mean, you've probably heard the story. And which pastor is that? Pastor Sheely. You know, so and you know he never was a pastor after that. You know, so but um, his um, his wife she she told him into the high school. They had three children. You know, they had um, my daughter and then they had twin boy and girl. You know, so now they lived in the parishes. You know, so but it was it was a bad situation. You know, so and, and like I said, we've had um highs and lows here, so but I'm still here. I'm, Fifty-three years now, so. and of course, there's a couple of others been here longer than me. So, you know, but, but anyway, I just—I mean, it was, and there's no way of forgetting it. You know, I mean, uh, I don't let it, you know, praise on my mind all the time. But they, you know, like you were talking about that, just draw it up, you know. So, but anyway, so things happen, you know. I'm like, you know, stuff just going on in the other churches, you know. Um, the other thing, so. so a lot of what she talks about here has to do with you know responding to somebody when when they're grieving or when something bad has happened because we don't know what to say. Um, I think there's more to this than that. Um, Like she said, it's been a while since I read this chapter. I like the part where she says that sometimes it's just a case of be of accompanying with somebody to well, be there to don't even have to say anything, just mm -hmm. your very presence, possibly a hug, mm -hmm. put so, your arm around your shoulder, yeah. shoulders and such. What we talk about in seminary is a ministry of presence. So, you know, it's it's fighting that urge to fill silence with words because ultimately those words are going to be meaningless. Right. Um, your words are not going to bring back the person. They're not going to ease the pain. They're not going to do anything. Right. So it's a lot easier to just be quiet mm -hmm. and just sit with the person sit, right. and let them know somebody's with them. Yeah, because people are going to say, well, I'm sorry. And I said, well... If this person hasn't gone through something like that, well, I told Kathy now, her husband, I mean, well, John died kind of like mama. So I told her I knew what she was going through. So I said that, like with my husband, they found the, the cancer in June and he died in September. And so, I mean, and that was kind of like John. I mean, he just got sick and went, you know, went downhill. So, and this, I mean, this is something you don't forget. I, I relived that. Over, uh, over and over and over. And I was, my daughter's and I was with you know, my husband when he died. Well, he was in hospice and when he died. And uh, so it, it's things that you just don't forget. And I, um, I'm not my toast, but when he, I felt his pulse when it was gone, I moved on and put my fingers right there and felt his last breath. Now, why I did that, I don't know, but I don't regret doing it. But I just, I, I just did it. So I see. I know you do things, and you know. But I don't know whether anybody else has ever done that or anything. But I did. And well, it's, it's just like when yeah. Mom passed away. I was showing her left hand, mm -hmm. and she went just to the bread. Mm -hmm. And Dad did the same thing. I was holding his left hand. Mm -hmm. Well, I was with him when my dad died. Stay away from my left hand. <laughs> <laughs> No, 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 and so I went into the room, and um, he and I thought he was asleep. 
He t- kind of coughed something like that, and that was it. He was going to. St- I don't know. I don't know whether he heard me talking. You know, they say some people will wait till they hear, you know, somebody's voice that they really, you know, know or what, and then they will just go. I don't know whether that, you know. I mean, I thought I thought about that a lot. So, and, uh, but, but anyway, I, you know, but, and I saw, uh, and my mother died of a heart attack. And she died before I could get home for in Ridgeville for the you know, and uh, and then I and then my brother died um, in 2008. It'll be 15 years next month, and he died. He died in the sleep. I, I was telling uh, Stephen. I said, well, I said he uh, died in the sleep, woke up in hell. That's where I took that. <laughs> so, and, uh, and I still miss him to this day. Like we were close as brothers. It's just the two of us. And uh, so, and so I'm the only one. I, I know my immediate family is still here. And uh, so, but, um, but anyway, you, you go on. I think I thank him. Thanks. I said, well, I really the Lord left me here for some reason. I said, but I'm still going. I still have aches and pains of uh, He came here you know. for the girls and the grandkids. And, mm-hmm. and uh, but, yeah, looking forward to that. I said, well, when my grandson got married, I got, and Katie, I think my granddaughter, she's finished her first year of college. And uh, so uh, I said, I want to be around to see her graduate and maybe see a great grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but, uh, but anyway. Excuse me, but I said, then I'll, I'll be 80 years old in October. And I said, I never thought I'd, I said, about my family, well, my dad died in 85, so I've lived my grandparents and, uh, um, and you know, the rest of my family. So, but, you know, you, you go on. So, <laughs> and I said, I wake up every morning, I said, well, thank you, Lord, for giving me another day. And, uh, when I was doing CPE, uh, the the first two phone calls I had were both at Richland, which is the, the level one trauma center, mm-hmm. um, Richland Memorial in Columbia. Um, and they were both ridiculously crazy nights. Um, like traumas, one right after another, mm-hmm. like like three ambulances come in, and then we look outside, there's a helicopter landing on the back, and it's just one thing after another. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, my first on call at the other hospital, which is Baptist, um, I was ready for it to be a calmer time, right? Because if you work day shift at Baptist, nothing happens. Okay, it's not a trauma support, it, it's rated like 11 trauma centers mm-hmm. since back up, right? So nothing ever happened. During the day, you sit in the chaplain's office, just sit there and stare at the keeper and stuff, and wait for it to go off. Sometimes you check the bathrooms to make sure it's still alive. Make sure you have a rest of um, And so the night I was prepared for that to be alive too, I had no sooner laid my head on the pillow in the sleep room when the phone went off, the keeper went off, and the pager, the other pager went off. Because I, I don't know which one they answered first. Um, and the first call was for, for a person who was on the floor that I was normally on, which was a step down in ICU. They called it double ICU. That was my, my assigned unit when I wasn't doing on call. Um, so I went over there, I knew all the nurses, I was talking to them, and what was going on. And they had a lady who had. Uh, terminal cancer, and she was ready to go. And so every time they walked out the room, she'd start yanking things off oh, and, and go. pulling IVs oh, yeah. out. And so they sent me in there to talk to her. And she's like, Tell me one good reason why I shouldn't keep doing this. I'm going to die anyway. I don't know what to say. Uh, you don't know. Please. Um, you know, I had another one one time where they had posted a security guard on the because the guy inside had uh, syphilis and it had progressed to his brain. 
don't treat it. And he was he was going to die. So he was in his own world. It's a very different world. One around us. Right. Um, and the security guards kept fighting with them because they were they couldn't understand what was going on. So I went in there and just kind of sat with them. It breaks whatever his world was and just kind of talked to him about that. All right down there. It was fine. No, sometimes it's Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you don't know what it is. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes the boys know you. So. Yeah, I got the family talking. Came down the hall and we were talking and the girl ran off. Yeah. Sometimes just the sight of the chat would scare me. Once I got the mom called out, she was fine, but I never did see the daughter again. I don't know where she ran off to. Um, my dad died, um, and then he's a pastor then, um, Dominic. Yep. He, he, um, he so comes to him and his wife coming to this Yeah, but yeah. Well, he was there for something about him. Uh, um, there was a chaplain in the hospital with dad died. So he came in. Pastor Vichy was fine for us. So he called the physician called Pastor Vichy. Yes, yeah, so he called Pastor Barney. I'm in it. He looked at me and I am in it. He was shot in. Pastor Nancy, Pastor Lynn. Do you know uh, this? Uh, the Van Bolden was out there, Pastor John Words. He, 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 John Words had. <laughs> um, but Glenn. I don't know why I would say pastor. I, I don't know why I would say Josh. I have to say pastor Josh. And, um, but. Well, <laughs> the people who call me Josh, when I don't. Yeah, I, I, say asked you, I, you know, I asked you one day. I said, would you rather be called? I said, because I'm a good bit over. You know what I mean? And I said, but I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with this. You know, so, I, mean, I, don't put, I mean, I don't put you up on a pedestal so or anything. But I mean, but you, uh, you hear me calling you Johnson. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I'm just saying, but you're a pastor of the church. And, and I mean, you supposed to the, you know, be our leader and stuff like that, you know. So, but um, anyway, I, um, <clears throat> I was uh, always thought of, you know, the pastor being. Like that, so, but uh, I mean, the rest of I mean, they would call that they called Glenn and then called John, and and but all the pastors ran had been called by the first time, yeah. And um, Pastor Richard, Pastor. yeah, well, I was calling him yeah. Pastor Richard, I didn't say, uh, I never did say Pastor Carl, I just said, I always said, Pastor and then Pastor Sherry, you know, yeah, well, okay, yeah. Everyone. I mean, I, I respected the, the title, I'll put it that way, so. it was like. Pastor Eddie, Pastor Sherry, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on down, sir. Pastor Josh. But <laughs> well, no, yeah. Pastor Josh talks. So why don't you just call me Josh? Yeah, yeah, no, it's all right, it's all right. But, but I mean, I, I every, I every pastor we've, we've had, yeah. they've been called by the first. Because, like I said, I, I came in se- the early part of seven. When I came, and, like I said, John, I mean, no. Uh, Glenn was still, he passed to Glenn, I put it say, was uh, still here. And he, he left in December that, of, of um, Saturday when he resigned. And, and then, then um, John, you know, came. So, Pastor John. Yeah. And uh, so, of course, both, uh, I mean, they they came right out, well, kind of like you right out of seminary, you know. And, uh, but, uh, but anyway, that's. Yeah. Uh, but I mean, I have respect for the, you know. The title. But I mean, because, I mean, we all human and we all do um, things that's not right and everything. <laughs> in, the, in the Lutheran tradition, 
I am no different than anybody else. Right. Um, that's what, that's I, what I'm I wear the, <laughs> the shirt because it's basically a uniform. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I go up there to preside at different things, it's I'm doing it on behalf of the congregation. So right. I'm serving. I'm not beating mm -hmm. as much. Right. Um, you know, we believe the priesthood of all believers, so we're all equal on equal footing. Mm -hmm. I just have, happen to have a fancy sheet of paper that says I went to seminary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, other people are, that you can perform yeah. duties that other people can't, yeah. you know, so. or that I'm, I'm somehow supposed to understand the mysteries of the divine, which is ridiculous because nobody does. No, no, um, no. Which is also why a lot of church fights are, are silly because we're fighting mm -hmm. about things we can't understand and making up our own. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you got I, this, what we like to talk about, you got these people that want so and so done in the church, and then you got these over here that don't want to do it, and it makes a, a split and stuff. And so then that's how it amazes me of the people that have gone through this church. Yeah. If you look at the the um, parish book from the beginning. I have, believe me. <laughs> and and you know some I of the know. names. I mean, and you know some of the names in there. There's um, they're still living here in North Carolina. Yeah. You know, they're, they're just, I just said pass through. I reckon you say so. It's just like um, Coach Swagger. I, I call him Coach because you know, and he was one of my teachers and. His dad was one of the ministers here, and you know, mm -hmm. I never asked about his dad, but you know, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, of course, that's more than the British, so. yeah. <laughs> but, you know. but I mean, it's you know, things that you know, you just like say, think about every once in a while, you know. Uh, I mean, I don't like to pray with my mind or anything, but I just say, you know, why. Why, why, why sometimes? <laughs> so, it's anyway. like, I, I tell everybody, you can ask God why, but you should never ask God why. Mm -hmm. And they go, why? Yeah. I'm like, it's how you put that emphasis on the word why. Mm -hmm. So I know we've gotten away from the stuff then. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's all related. We want to. What was talking about? You know, back, yeah. well, saying, you know, telling people you're sorry. You know, I know what you're going through when you don't know what this person's going through. Uh, you know what what is done to their lives or, or whatever. Well, it's like you can, yeah. you can you can have shared a similar experience, but because everybody is unique, right? right. You, you can't necessarily feel exactly what they're hurting. Mm -hmm. I mean, like you mentioned, uh, you could relate to Kathy's position mm -hmm. right now. Right. But at the same time, she's got her own history. history right. That, her grief she's got to go through. Well, yeah, and, and, and her, her past could have influenced the today, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. different than what your past did. Yeah, right. So, right. you know, she, she may be going through <laughs> the same experience, but with different Mm -hmm. History and different mindset. Well, I'm mean, like they they knew each other in school, and then it just kind of got separated out of you say, and then they got back together, you know. So, but um, yeah. but, so yeah. I know. Can I ask you a question? I know we're not supposed to question God. About you know oh, things no, like that. We've had we've had <laughs> talks about this. <laughs> and, if uh, Job can go on a on a ten minute tirade, God, for everything that's going on, then there's no reason we can't question God. Yeah. yeah. What we can't do is try to be God. No, no, I know. Yeah, I know that. But I did that like some um, Like I said, it's uh, it's yeah. okay to ask God why. Yeah. But it's never okay to say why. Yeah. You know, right. Yeah. It's like. When I found that I had five brain tumors, I'm like, why? Mm -hmm. Why but you? Right. Mm -hmm. I thought about it and I go, why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, well, that's right. Why not? Well, I suppose it's good. When I was talking about, um, when my, um, my brother died, it really hit me because he, he went all of a sudden. So, and uh, like I said, he died in his sleep. 
Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back just a little bit. But the, um, he died on, a, on June the 14th, which was a Saturday of that year. And he, we, I was living in the way I was living in there. And um, he lived in Ridgeville, so we weren't that far apart, you know, li living that far apart. But he had come by that Monday and with his wife, Linda. And, and um, I mean, I wasn't looking for him to come. He just dropped by in the Southern Sweet Town. And Tracy and Dylan and Katie happened to be that side. And so I was so glad after what happened, you know. And uh, so we were, you know, talking, they left. So that Thursday night, he called me. I was a clear blue sky, and, uh, and we talked for a little while. And he always ended it with, love you, sis. And that's what I had. That was the last words I heard from him. And then he, he, just a couple of days later, he was gone, you know. So. I, I said, I didn't know whether that was God working in there, not for him to come come see me and then, then call me, you know. So, anyways. Things you think of, so. <clears throat> so, in, in answering or in, in working to break this this law, uh, this idea of never tell your real story, vulnerability is weakness. Um, she breaks it up into acts, right? So, Act One: Love listens. Um, listening is an incredibly important thing. Um, when we when we listen, like truly listen, okay, and we're, we're quiet and we're engaged and we're thinking about what we're hearing, okay, mm -hmm. um, and and being present with the person who's hurting, then they feel some sense just from having somebody hear them and know that somebody's there. Um, and by practicing listening, you actually can get your mind out of the way so you're not wanting to to jump in every five seconds with the oh I know about that because mm -hmm. X. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. One of the things they taught us by my, my supervisor and CP was obsessed with stories, our personal stories. It's what he was writing his paper on so he could be, stop being a provisional CP supervisor and start being a full supervisor. Right. And so his big thing was our stories and how our stories impacted whatever ministry we were doing, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, whenever you went into a room, you would bring in somebody with you from your past, according mm -hmm. to him, and, and, and you had to figure out why that person was there mm -hmm. and all this stuff. It used to drive me nuts because, mm -hmm. you know, like, my first CPE interaction that I had to write a didactic, which is a report, Mm -hmm. About they tore me to pieces. I thought I left out of that room feeling like I was the worst freaking pastoral caregiver ever to walk the face of the earth. Like I got in my car and was like, I'm just gonna quit seminary and be done. <laughs> um it was bad. And it was all because they went down the road and why are you writing Spanish? Because <laughs> I'm trying to learn. <laughs> We're learning right now. <laughs> anyway, it's all because we went down this rabbit hole about my dad <coughs> being president of the group. I was like, I don't think he was. Mm -hmm. But it, I guess his point was that I, I talked more than I should have. I didn't know what else to do because the guy was like, he would talk and then he would look at me for a response. What was I supposed to do? Just look at him. <laughs> you know, it's all uh, Okay. Um, <laughs> you'd be awful lonely if I leave. <laughs> you wouldn't leave. So, listening is a really important skill to, to work on. It's one you have to constantly work on um, because it's really easy for you to, to hear something that reminds you of something that as soon as you do, you're down that road and mm -hmm. now you've changed the whole conversation to be about you. You know, you've hijacked. Um, so she gives a bunch of examples in here. Um, 
you know, some good ones from scripture, especially. Um, you know, Proverbs. Yeah, Proverbs is at the beginning there. Um, you know, I think probably the most interesting line in here is, I would not pray to a clueless God who had never known love or love's loss any more than I would ask advice from an armadillo. Yeah, okay. They always be digging little holes by your... Yes, they do. Um, they also end up on the side of That's another matter. Um, when you get to Act 2, she starts talking about the uh, arts of accompaniment and presence, which we've already talked a little bit about. Um, there's just a lot to be said just for being there with someone. Um, the, the trick is when you accompany somebody, you're, you're walking alongside them. You're not leading them or guiding them. Okay? You're not steering. You're just walking with them. Um, that's especially important in grief conversations, in grief work, because you know they they used to teach in school years ago that the what was it, the the Cooper Ross um, stages of grief, so the five stages, right? And they taught for years that it was a linear progression through those five stages that you would go from anger to whatever. But the reality is that it's not a walk in a straight line through that process. It's a continual process and you flip back and forth depending on things that hit you. Okay? <laughs> you know, there. my dad died in 2005. I still get mad at him. It doesn't make any rational sense, but it's just where I'm at, right? You know, I, I still wonder what if. I still wonder Mm -hmm. You know, the, the delusional fantasy of maybe he faked it, he's living somewhere else. <laughs> I would do that. Then maybe that's what he would do. You know, but I think about calling dad's phone sometimes just to see the answer. Yeah. Um, or at least he didn't answer. But he never has. No, he never had a question, so. Uh, <clears throat> but it just things like that. Mm -hmm. So when you have somebody that you're talking to who's going through that process, you know, you can't lead them through. You can't push them through. All you can do is walk beside them and just meet them where they're at. Yeah. When I say this, this knowing that somebody's with you, I mean, you don't have to say anything, you know, but I, that's hard to say, you know. Not say anything. I mean, you want to, and then, but you don't want to be saying the wrong thing and get this person all upset or whatever. You know, so. You know, I think probably the hardest thing is when, and it sounds bad, but when somebody's experienced a loss and you're trying to, to care for that person and they just seem sad, 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 sad for a long, long time, mm -hmm. and you're like, why aren't you over this yet? Mm -hmm. you no, know, which is a stupid thing to say. Same. Terrible. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But, so, but you really don't know what's going on in the mind. You know, the, and this, some people can get over things quicker than others. I mean, you know, yeah, so my grandmother, um, she lost her husband. Second husband. Second husband, two days uh, before dad passed away. So I lost my grandfather and my oh, dad yeah, in the yeah, same yeah. week. Um, but she used to be like a really heavy set person. Mm -hmm. And she's lost so much weight now that she's skinny as or not skinnier yes. than this body. Yeah, just kind of. Well, I mean, yeah, some people mm -hmm. grieve themselves. Like, you know, she like can barely eat you now. She'll take a couple exactly. bites and then she's, she's, she's done. Mm -hmm. She has a shrine in her living room set up to him. This is your grandmother you're talking about? It's got a picture and it's a little creepy. Some people that do that, I mean, they just grieve themselves to death and. I'm just grieving to death. I mean, there's a 
and this is kind of give up. I reckon you'd say so. Well, she always thought she would go before him since she has. Mm -hmm. uh, well, that's something you don't know. Yeah, what is the COPD? Um, <clears throat> <laughs> So that is an example of hijacking. That's, that's what just happened right before you. First time, uh, my father in law died four months before my dad died. Yeah. And uh, his father in law died, died in October of 98. Dad died in February of 99. Oh, it's just like dad died November 6th. And then November 8th, my uncle Donnie, my dad's brother. Oh, who died? Oh, and so I have a I got disenfranchised screen. I mean, I read it in the social psychologist. I mean, on page 25. Yeah. I would like to take my person in on Puncher's social psychologist. Well, the, so the social psychologists aren't the ones saying you can't feel it. Okay. They're, they've named the phenomenon that is society saying you can't. Okay. The, the, their grief is at grief. Oh, you So, so disenfranchised grief is when, is when society says, okay, you should not be grieving over this. So shut up and get over it. Uh, which happens more often than you think, and it happens in the church environment right, right. way too often. Mm -hmm. We should be a close knit family who, who comes together, but what you see more often is that you know pastoral care is left to the pastor, mm -hmm. and nobody's checking on other people, right. you know, and that's that's a problem. Um, but the example she gives on one fifty six are like. Divorce, miscarriage, infertility, absent parents, retirement, you know, these are things that people don't feel like they're allowed to grieve. Mm -hmm. And she says that she would go further and claim that some forms of grief are far more for disenfranchised than others. Um, our culture and its ferocious faith laws disenfranchise virtually all grief to some degree. Okay. So... Um, if you look back on 153, she's talking about her friends. So she talks about all the time friends and good time friends, which are pretty self explanatory. What do you think good time friends are? Friends said, come, hey, let's go have a drink. And, you know, all right, see you next week. You know. And then the all the time friends are the ones who actually pick up the phone when something bad is happening. In some cases, this is this is just a weird experience that I've had. I, I don't know if it's just me, but anytime something bad has happened, like, like really bad, two things have happened. One, time seems to slow down and condense. Okay, but also people who should not be around suddenly appear. So like the night my dad died. I'm pulled him off the waterbed and starting CPR on the floor, right? The first paramedic to walk in was a person I went to high school with mm. who normally worked in Georgetown. And he happened to be a working volunteer up in Andrews that night. So that was weird, okay? And then I go outside as they're loading data and suddenly, my best friend from high school and his parents are walking across the lawn to come see what's going on because they just happen to be at Piggly Wiggly right across the street. And then other friends are appearing out of nowhere. It's just, you know, it's just weird. This has happened every time something bad has happened. 
right? Like these random, mm -hmm. they just show up. Um, an all the time friend is someone who maybe doesn't just appear like I've experienced, but but will pick up the phone when something has happened, will be there for you, will mm -hmm. come and, and just sit and listen. A good time friend forgets you exist when something bad happens. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like a death. Well, it is it, uh, that um, is when you're down and out, you find quickly who your friends are. You know, you might say, well, so I know, uh, you know, somehow, uh, well, I know this person's going to show up with that person, and they, they're not there. You know, they're, you know, so, but you feel like you've been close to for a long time and everything, so. Yeah. We always say that people, you know, they come at, my husband said, well, this is before, he, you know, dying, he said, I didn't want anybody to come to my funeral, and I hadn't seen them in a long time. But, and that's the truth. You see people come to a funeral that you hadn't seen in years, and um, and you wonder why they got to show up then. I mean, if you couldn't come see me while I'm alive, don't come see me after I've died. That's the way he put it. So. And, uh, now, how do you feel about that? Uh, no, I, I understand. <laughs> I've, I've, uh, I've briefly thought about recording a video message to be played at my funeral. Mm -hmm. Just like naming people and identifying the ones who still owe me money. That's not a I'm not playing that. <laughs> yeah, if I'm still alive. That or, that or I want a full casket funeral. And at the end of the funeral, I want the organist no. to slowly start to play the Jack no. in the Box <laughs> until everybody is staring at the casket. <laughs> See if you pop out of it. I can tell you that one I wear that to do for. I guess it says, I read this in when God called Master Sean. Why did Jesus say, you know, Master's come back, you know? Why did Jesus do that and not follow through with God's plan? Well, because it was God's plan to resurrect Lazarus. Okay. So this was, this was remember, you're getting into the exegetical territory there, but what it is is, you have to remember the way that, that passage is structured in John, okay? Right. So Jesus had just had to flee Jerusalem yeah. before this because he had used some of the I am statements as the confirmation students recognize today, and they wanted to stone him for claiming divinity, okay? When he found out that Lazarus was sick, he came back even though you know, Bethel was just outside of Jerusalem. Um, then the people who are identified as the Jews, these are people who had been actively opposing him, who come down from Jerusalem to see the family and to be part of the grieving process as it existed then. Um, and he basically, in their face, showed that he had the power over life and death. Mm -hmm. And he knew I would argue that he cried not because Lazarus had died, because it doesn't make sense for him to have cried over that, because he knew what was going to happen. I would argue he was crying as much for for the grief he saw as for concern over Mary's or over Mary's faith, and in knowing that this was going to be the step or the straw that broke the camel's back. Right. Mm -hmm. That once he raised Lazarus from the dead. That was it, because the Pharisees and everybody were going to be dead set he was going to die. Right. And so as soon as he did it, those people ran back to the Pharisees and reported it, mm -hmm. and they found a way to arrest him right. and execute him. He's dead four days after it, this. Um, you know the thought I have <laughs> about if Adam and Eve had sinned, what the world would be alive. That ever going through yeah. my mind. Yeah. <laughs> and and with the you know, like that too with Jesus. I mean he he knew 
understand why he was put on earth for, for three years to do this. He went up preaching on that now, you know, and uh, so I mean, I've, I've, I've often thought about that, you know. I, I ask Pastor Bush, like, if Judas had killed himself after he betrayed Jesus, that Jesus would have been there. And Pastor said, yes. And so, I mean, I, 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 mean I, I, sh I shouldn't be gone feeling that way, should I? I mean, to think that, you know, I mean, just, no, okay. you, just, you know, just to think about, you know, what would have happened. Yeah. You know, if this happened, you know, if this didn't happen or that didn't happen, stuff. And the stuff that's going on yeah. around in the world now, you know, yeah. so, so that you never thought it would happen. Because so. Jesus told Peter he would deny him three yeah. times. Right. And he just said, no, I don't know. And Peter did, and Jesus still forgave him. Oh, not right. If you look on at the top of 157, <laughs> She talks about one of the uh, people have great uh, have great wisdom to offer you only if you take all those heavy weather forms off you. So when you let yourself out, you're able to connect with you. So she says that one of those people who can't connect with you, open yourself up, is God. Because the message of the cross is twofold. One, God stays, okay? And God has a story of grief just like you. Oh, I can't imagine that God was happy to see Jesus crucified. Oh, I mean, I thought about that too. Right. Oh, no. I mean, his only, his only son. I imagine that God experiences grief on a number of levels. Yeah, I think. Yeah. And God looks at the world and sees the God's way we out. fight each other and destroy things. Right. I mean, I mean, look at the. You know, the world today, I, I never thought that stuff would be going on like it is. But, I mean, I've never, um, and the, the hatred is like it's, it's, it's the hatred for people. Hatred is this weird anger that just lingers right beneath the surface. You never know what's going to set. And Somebody I, else. I, you can say one word and set them off. You know, and there's, and, and there's, it's on both sides of the political spectrum. You know, one of the things that surprised me was like, well, that I knew up in Pennsylvania, church, that I, I didn't have mm -hmm. worked with and everything one of them I recommended to run for council. Well, they were at the Capitol on January 6th. Mm -hmm. They were inside on January 6th, and they went to jail for January 6th. Mm -hmm. And, and, what was a couple of them down here for, for, for Hannah or somewhere that they that they go? I, and so, you know, I I don't understand that amount of anger to something like that, that right. over over something that really is rather insignificant. People, like you see people riding around with the. Uh, you know, when Trump was president, you saw people riding around with anti-Trump signs. When they were Biden president, you see let's go Brandon or whatever signs, right? And like the people who stand like the, the people who do those things are like they're invested in it. And they spent money on this. That's and right. like like they, like they they are invested in it and they are past. Yeah, yeah, I don't want And it. it's like, why are you like this? Because exactly what effect? What daily effect does the President of the United States have on your life? Yeah. Zero. Zero. There's nothing he's I mean, doing that's affecting you. Yeah, I mean, you can say things about him and all that, just how you feel about it. Yeah, I mean, oh, well, yeah, but you you're know, perfectly but, free to yeah. brag about I mean, I mean, the First Amendment. Yes, you do. Right? It's too good. You have to speak your whatever. <laughs> and I know just, all this badness is going on. Okay. I mean, this is, I mean, this is a torn up world. And this, uh, I mean, and that's, that's, I think, part of the problem that we face is that you know, we don't have a good answer for why the world to huh. We don't have a good answer for and why then, there's. And people will tell me, well, I, I noticed the end of time, I, nobody knows that. 
No, people no, have been saying it's the end of time. I'm so the end of time. I know, from the yeah. end. And these people get up and say, it's going to end uh, July the 5th, 2023, or something yeah. like that. And we're still going after that time. You know, well, so. and that's, that's, yeah. what I, that's what I say. People have been predicting the end since forever. And, and like I told y'all a couple of years ago, after somebody predicted it, it survived. Yeah, you know, yeah. If the world happens to the end tomorrow, rest assured you do not need to come to church on Sunday. <laughs> Yeah, right. right. <laughs> but um, I mean, I, I was talking to this lady. I, she used to come to church a long time ago, and I was talking to her one morning. She said, and we were talking about different things, feelings and stuff like that. Too. And she said, she said, well, I know that the end of the world is coming soon. And I said, well, you know, it could come tomorrow. Could come next. Months, next week, next year, or whatever. Nobody knows that. When you know. people ask me that, there's two things I know for sure. There's a guy that knows it, and I'm not him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, right. You don't know those answers. Yeah. So. I just, I, I find it interesting that people who are Bible, who are biblical literists, <laughs> you know, who, who take it right at text value. Mm -hmm. will argue on such important things. Like they'll say they'll say they know that the end of the world's coming, but Jesus clearly says in every translation, no one knows There's the day of the time. And then you gotta say okay. my, my daughter's good about this. So I, I'll tell her I well, I read so and so and they say it. She says, Well who is the, the who is they? <laughs> and that's a good yeah. I never thought about it, so she's and I said, I just never took it like that. But she said, well, who is they? I said, well, I don't know who they are. <laughs> and then I guess the other one is, is you know, Jesus said, this is my body, this is my blood. And that immediately makes people go, no, 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 no. This represents Jesus' body but, and um, blood. It's not, oh, okay. it's not real. It's right. not real. Right. It's just, right. well, I mean, there are the words. You're the one who believes everything in there. So... Um, when I was at Eaton last night with some friends, and when I was talking about uh, Episcopal priests, I mentioned this to you today, I uh, um, said they, that the Bible is out of date, and it should be. I know there's a lot of revisions of it, you know, um, but how do you feel about somebody saying something like that? I mean, how do you to change? You know, well, I mean, we can. I mean, I don't know if I was taking it wrong or what. We, you know, can, so. <laughs> we can update the translation because, right. like, the NRSV, which we use, just came out with an updated edition. So oh, it's okay. an NS, NRSV UE now, oh, okay. which makes it. Now, I just want to call it the Nerds View. <laughs> no, uh, okay. But, you know, it's got some updated language in it. Mm -hmm. um, and. and Part of what they've been doing is going through and and helping to clarify some of the the overuse of masculine pronouns because mm -hmm. like we tend to call the ESV the ESV is very good at translating the Hebrew well okay, okay. Mm -hmm. but we also have nicknamed it the extra sexist version because it goes out of its way to use masculine pronouns when they're not necessary oh, okay. Okay. and like like if you look at the Hebrew. It'll be the Hebrew word for God, and they'll use he. And it's like, oh, you didn't translate the text. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm just saying, you know, I mean, for, for a priest to say, you know, uh, like I said, I know they say it was Episcopal priest. I don't know where he was from or around here or what else, you know, but I'm mean, husband to have, you know. And um, to say that, I mean, like I say, with uh, well, Bonnie and I talked about too, look, well, you brought up with the King James Version, which was real hard to understand. Well, stuff. it was hard and, for the people in 1611 to understand. And, they right, speak and, language. Right, right. And uh, but I said, and then they came up with what we use, the Revised Standard Version. And uh, so, and to me, that was a uh, a little bit more explanatory, you know, what you're reading yeah. and you could understand each of those. Are. I mean, I think there's there's trans there's better translations and stuff, and there's there's updates that can be made as we because what happens is as we find more ancient documents, we're able to better understand the languages and the way words were used. Mm -hmm. There are passages in some of the letters of Paul that are absolutely incomprehensible. 
Mm-hmm. Okay, because the original or the oldest version of the papyrus we have has no spaces. It's all capital letters. Has no punctuation, and it just runs on. No, 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 no. So you don't know where one word ends yeah, and another word begins because mm-hmm. there's multiple possibilities. Mm-hmm. And then you know, Greek depends on its endings to identify whether it's present or you know whether it's subjunctive or all these different things, right? Mm-hmm. And sometimes <coughs> those endings are identical, which mm-hmm. can make it either like passive or it can make it future or it can make it <laughs> and then you're just looking at the word like I don't know what this means. <laughs> Paul, what did you mean? <laughs> it's just like I, I like watching the bottom stuff on the history channel. And they go we found more books in the Bible that have been left out or mm-hmm. well, well, some well stuff. okay so so let's let's fact check that because <laughs> the history channel once they got bought out by the company that owned Lifetime, got real hysterical with real Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's when the ancient aliens took over. Um, so the books weren't left out of the Bible, like they were hidden away or something like that. The the canonized or the canonization process took two hundred years to be finalized, okay? Mm-hmm. And the books that did not make it into the canon did not make it for a reason. Most of the old Hebrew books that they say were left out of the Bible are actually books that were composed around the time of Daniel or the intertestament period just before Jesus. And you can tell that because of the language they use, the way they use the Hebrew, the way they they anticipate this this Reordering of creation in the same way that Daniel does. It's apocryphal literature, okay? Uh, or apocalyptic literature, that's the word. Um, in the New Testament, you can tell that some of these books were written well after the ministry of Jesus. And some of them were just ridiculous. Like there's one that tells, I think it's the Gospel of Thomas, that tells the story of young Jesus. Uh, getting mad at a friend while they're playing on the roof of his house. Oh and he God. pushes him off and kills his friend when his oh mom God. comes out and yells at him and comes down and resurrects him. Oh my okay. God. And the, the church said, uh, no. <laughs> okay. Um, so, like, I mean, even Revelation, you know, we spent weeks going through Revelation. Revelation barely made it into the camp. Mm-hmm. Okay. And the reason was because it didn't represent historical Christian views. The whole point of of Revelation is that people who currently have all the wealth and all the food and all the stuff and are oppressing the Christians will one day have their position swapped and will have all the food and all the money and we can oppress those people. And that is so far from what Jesus said to do. That it's not recognizable as Christianity. Right? Okay, I don't know what John the Divine's <laughs> fantasy was about, but it was, it was out there. Okay, and so for two hundred years, people were like, "That doesn't belong." Mm-hmm. The only reason it made it was because they were having the debates about whether Jesus was fully human or fully divine or both. Mm-hmm. And Revelation connects Jesus as the Alpha and the Omega. And pictures him seated at the right hand of God. And so it served the narrative for what the majority of the church wanted to say. Yes, I've read the book of Revelation four times, and each time I'm like, I found stuff I didn't understand. And yeah, yeah. I mean, if you remember that the book of Revelation is primarily a text aimed at the Roman Empire and, and saying, you people are going to fail, and we are going to rise. And the sad part is, ultimately, that did happen. You know, mm-hmm. once we got, once Christians became legalized and got the power, boy, did we. Mm-hmm. You know, they created essentially a, a Christian state in the wet in Western Europe for five, six centuries. Right. You know. No, I remember they said, um, they, yeah, I'm saying they said, <laughs> um, but Jesus and Mary Magdalene are getting married. Yeah. 
or I don't, well, did they have a child? Well, how did they call it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's where it came from. Yes, that's right. I never did read that. So. There, there is a gospel, or there is a fragment of parchment that they found in the Egyptian desert, which almost certainly means it was from the Coptics. The Coptic Christians are people who do not accept the the ruling of the Council of Nicaea that Jesus was one with God. Yeah. Uh, they they say Jesus was was a human prophet, that kind of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Coptics are primarily in Egypt, but there are Syriac Coptics as well. They're heavily persecuted and it's very sad because what, what are they called? Coptic? Yeah, Coptics. C O P T Coptics. C O P T I C. Yeah, there you go. Oh C O P T I T I C. Okay. I couldn't remember. It's, it's transliterated from Greek. Um, but you know, they're heavily persecuted, but it probably came from them and it suggests in the three or four lines that they recovered that Mary had some type of relation, Mary Magdalene had some type of relationship mm -hmm. with Jesus. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there's so many traditions that exist about Mary Magdalene, ridiculous. People, for a long time, called her a prostitute. No, That's no. not in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's never been in the Bible. I mean, he's, Jesus a, came and said that she had all his husbands, and he'd do that. I mean, it was it was something that that was basically invented by people who were trying to get more meaning out of the text than what was actually. Yeah, right. Um, and, and the other thing is, Mary Magdalene may not mean Mary of Magdala. It may it may mean the Hebrew word Magdala can also mean tower. So it may be that she was nicknamed Mary the Tower, just like Peter was Peter the Rock. Right. Okay. And like Jesus was just handing out nicknames to people okay. that were going to be foundational to Christianity. I'm always sure that Mary was Jesus' favorite female disciple. Well, I think she I think she was easily his favorite disciple. Yeah. I mean, he didn't he didn't appear at the tomb for just anybody. Mm -hmm. Showed up for her. Mm -hmm. well, and I, I, I repeat this every Easter and I will continue to repeat it until somebody listens if it weren't for women there would be no gospel because they were the first evangelists they were not believed they they ran back and told the men and the men didn't were like, oh, okay. the, the rock no. fell away on their shiny no, yeah, they believe. Um, what mushroom did you eat on the way here <laughs> You know, oh, it, was, it was just like nervous, you know, doubting because, you know, he. I, I kind of wish I had been here that Sunday to preach on that because I have a problem with that. People have always called him Doubting Thomas, right? right? Because of the way the text portrays him. But if you look at the only other place he speaks in John, it's in the same scene you were talking about earlier. When they're going back to where Lazarus is, and Thomas says, "Let us go with him, so that we can die with him." Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I would say that that Thomas is not the doubting type, but Thomas is actually the one who's who's ready to go and mm -hmm. and everything. And and you know he he's not doubting that Jesus is resurrected. He wants to see Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But so you got, like, so you got people that can come up with. I don't know where they. I mean, I reckon the mom, the people, the stuff they can come up with, and oh, yeah. take some, take something, and way out of text, and mean uh, this means entirely different what is what you know. The, I might believe in, but they turn it around, you know, whatever. So. People do all kinds of crazy things, and it's and, not. It's not just related to the Bible. I passed a car on my way to the Senate office yesterday. Had a bumper sticker on it that said 9 11 was an inside job. <laughs> oh my God. I mean, mm. if you believe that, mm. whatever. Well, the, you know, and, and some people don't believe that. Is yeah. it is a sad part about it? I mean, it, some, some people, people are so gullible. <laughs> some people are so gullible. I know. 
Well, uh, my great uncle was at Pearl Harbor, but his ship was out with the aircraft carriers, and they saw the Japanese fleet, and they were ordered not to tell. So, mm -hmm. you know. Those. Sometimes you you know you just yeah. just wonder why they why they have I mean, I mean everything happens for a reason. Yeah. But sometimes you wonder why that happened. Because you'll hear this and that and is that they uh talking about well talk about Pearl Harbor that the our government knew it was gonna happen. So I, I don't know whether that's true well, or what. I mean, the government, the government yeah. knew something was coming. Yeah, they right. just didn't know right. what and yeah. where. Yeah. I think it was they true. thought, the, and the reason they had forwarded people to it, they figured the attack was going to come either at Midway or Wake Island. Mm -hmm. And yeah. the attack right. did so. come to both of those places, right. but not until afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, it came to the Philippines first and right. Pearl Harbor in the Philippines but, um, and then Wake Island on the same day. Because it was, um, what was that? Uh, Roosevelt, the new president, yeah. and Theodore Roosevelt. Yeah. Theodore, yeah. No, Franklin. Franklin, Franklin, Franklin right, actually. Sorry. Yeah, Franklin, right. Sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, History major. Um, history major. Right. Yeah. Well, I thought that was a well, I have a crap ton of books on my shelf in the house that will contain all the information you ever wanted to know about World War II, World War I, mm -hmm. Vietnam, Korea, Civil War, Revolutionary Every War. Every single war there is. But and I'm a lot of the history in between. And yeah. The problem is that the habit of buying books and the habit of reading books are completely disconnected habits. Mm -hmm. I, I can attest to that. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't think, this is me, fact, this that the, the um, yeah. Viet, Vietnam War should never been fought. No, it should have been. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this. Because, so, I mean, they went out. Bye-bye. <laughs> and, um...